This video lecture is about Model Rule 1.8a, which is about conflicts of interest. It's part of a section of the 1.8 rules are about the lawyer's personal conflicts of interest with the client. And it's really kind of a hodgepodge. For students, it's um, a little more interesting than one of the rules where we go on and on and on about one thing because there's a lot of variety in the situations described. Now, 1.8a is about business transactions with um, the client, and of all of the 1.8 rules, this is probably the most important and has the most complicated provisions and uh, the most comments. So we're talking about a business transaction with your client, and I have a sort of a splash screen here um, about that communicates. These things can really turn into a headache. And what are we talking about? Um, lots of situations where lawyers will um, maybe want to uh, buy something from a client, like the client's house or car, or the lawyer is looking to sell their car or their boat or their lake house or something like that, some, uh, lease out some extra office space. And so either the lawyer becomes the seller or, or lessor uh, and the client, the buyer, or vice versa. And so sometimes you have a, a the client is looking to <clears throat> sell their home or their second home or their vacation home and the lawyer decides to buy that. So that's a very simple, straightforward transaction. Um, as we'll see, the most common transaction though is loans, is uh, client lawyers lending money to their own clients or even more often, a lawyer borrows money from a client who's had a windfall. So let's look at the rule 1.8a. A lawyer shall not enter into a business transaction with a client or knowingly acquire an ownership, possessory, security, or other pecuniary interest adverse to a client unless. I couldn't fit this whole rule on one slide, as you'll see in a moment why. But we, as with most model rules, we start with sort of a sweeping prohibition. No business transactions with your clients and no <clears throat> a, a business transaction where you're acquiring some sort of ownership or security interest that's adverse uh, to your client unless certain conditions are met. And this is a very cluttered slide, and I put it all here for a reason um, to show you that there's a lot of hoops to go through, that this, uh, this rule is complicated. So uh, here's our unless uh, provisions. So first of all, and you have to have all of these in place in order to do a business deal or a business transaction with your client. <clears throat> the transaction and the terms on which the lawyer acquires the interest are fair and reasonable. And I, the bold print is my doing, it's not from the ABA. I'm highlighting things to watch for for my students. Fair and reasonable to the client and are fully disclosed and transmitted in writing in a manner that can be reasonably understood by the client. Two, the client is advised in writing of the desirability of seeking and is given a reasonable opportunity to seek the advice of independent legal counsel on the transaction. And three, the client gives informed consent in a writing signed by the client to the essential terms of the transaction and the lawyer's role in the transaction, including whether the lawyer is representing the client in the transaction. So again, if you want to do a business transaction with your client, and a lot of, uh, the, this is very common, right, that people have clients who are uh, successful clients who need, are looking for someone to buy something and you happen to be in the market for it. Um, <clears throat> you, um, you're looking for office space and you have a client who um, owns a commercial building that, and, and has available space that they'd like to lease to you, or, your landlord becomes your um, uh, becomes one of your clients, and then uh, um, at some point there's a lease modification, and now your landlord is also one of your clients. On and on and on, and you have to go through all of these hoops um, in order to consummate that transaction, or you will be subject to discipline. I'm going to unpackage these one by one. So let's go through them one by one. The first one, I hope you see, we could have broken in, the, the ABA could have broken this into several um, sub provisions. So 1.8A1 uh, um, uh, is the transaction and the terms on which the lawyer acquires the interest are fair and reasonable to the client, are fully disclosed and transmitted in writing in a manner that can be reasonably understood by the client. And so 
first, uh, uh, to, just to make sure you understand, we have sort of subparts to this. It has to be a fair and reasonable transaction. In other words, um, even if you do everything else required under this rule, if this is a lopsided agreement, a sweetheart deal where the client is selling you something for a fraction of its fair market value, let's say, um, then that's not fair and reasonable to the client. Now, can we do it the other way? Can you um, give the client far more or, than um, something is worth? Or could the client buy, could you give the client an incredible deal? Sure. What we're really worried about here is lawyers exploiting their clients. And so um, if, you, if your client sells you something for a fraction of its fair market value, that's presumptively not going to be a fair and reasonable deal for your client. Um, secondly, uh, you have to, the, the terms have to be fully disclosed and explained to the client. And I have seen situations where lawyers bought a house from or sold a house to the client and, and then offered to, to arrange the financing, let's say, and um, didn't really explain all the details to the client. So we have to have really full disclosure err on the side of caution or, um, or complete transparency here. And then notice um, the terms have to be put in writing to the client. So no oral business deals with your client or oral agreements. I understand from in, under your contracts class, you probably learned that oral contracts can be binding. You might make a contract that's binding with your client from the purposes of contract law. So maybe you can get it, you could seek enforcement of it or your client could seek enforcement of it. But even if it's a valid contract, you could be subject to discipline for not putting it in writing. And so make sure that you understand that, that just because it's a valid contract um, as an oral contract doesn't mean that you are covered from a disciplinary standpoint. And the writing has to be in a manner that can be understood by the client. And so again, uh, of, we're worried about lawyers trying to obfuscate with um, legal jargon and archaic terminology, the heretofores and wheretofores and things like that. So we're going to try to read it from the client's perspective after the fact. Number two, the client also has to be advised in writing. And please notice this is the second written document that has to be part of the transaction of the desirability of seeking and given reasonable opportunity to seek the advice of independent legal counsel on the transaction. So you have to give your client a document saying, I hereby advise you in writing that it would be a good idea for you to talk to a second lawyer about this, about this transaction. And then you don't get to, what you don't get to do is say, um, but the deal is off the table, uh, you know, uh, first thing tomorrow morning or at midnight tonight. Um, it takes time for a client to schedule appointments and um, uh, uh, with a lawyer with a lawyer and go in for a consultation and so forth. So you have to, if you're going to do a business transaction with your client, you have to advise them in writing that it would be a good idea for them to get another talk to another lawyer and give them time to find another lawyer. <clears throat> Three, the client gives informed consent in a writing signed by the client. So this is the third type of document. Of course, these could all be attached um, to the essential terms of the transaction. So we're going to have uh, the client sign something uh, with the basic terms of like the price paid and the item being sold or leased. And then specifically, this, docu this third document must specify the lawyer's role in the transaction. In other words, if you are gonna try, the, try to tell the client, um, uh, I'm the other party transacting with you and your lawyer at the same time, you need to own that and spell it out in writing and the client has to sign it. Now, I have to warn you, um, there's a handful of companies that uh, have control most of the market share for legal malpractice insurance in this country. And uh, so we have a few big companies uh, that really provide most of the legal malpractice insurance. And um, uh, as a tip for my law students, um, several of these companies uh, run blogs or websites uh, where they post stuff that they wish lawyers, their policyholders would read about how to avoid getting sued for malpractice. And here's a tip. They hate it when their lawyers who own in, uh, malpractice insurance policies do business transactions with their clients and they plead with you not to do it. 
this generates a lot of malpractice claims. Now, when we talk about 1.8a, we're talking about disciplinary actions, like you getting your license suspended or, or even getting disbarred uh, um, from the state um, disciplinary authority, the state bar. But you could also end up uh, generating a legal malpractice claim from your client, so watch out for that. Here's a quote, one real risk with these deals is that the business does not really prosper or terribly falters. What are we talking about? Very common that the lawyer decides to invest in a client's startup business. So this is another type of business deal is your client's launching a business and <clears throat> they're looking for investors and you have some, you're doing well as a lawyer. So you have um, uh, some investment money and you decide to give your client, let's say $10,000 or $20,000 for a small ownership share um, in the company. We're not talking about publicly traded stocks from a finance standpoint, we would call this private equity or something like that. And, and so what goes wrong is either um, the, the business turns out to be incredibly successful, like this is the next Facebook or Google or Amazon or something like that. It, it, it starts raining billions of dollars. And trust me, the client's going to be pretty mad that you get this, that you suddenly become a billionaire because um, you loaned them a few thousand dollars. And um, it can greatly complicate things. If you've um, read about or watched movies about the, the early days of some of these big companies like Facebook, you know that there's people who put money in, in the uh, early on who then were forced out um, uh, later. And so if it takes off, this can be a bad deal. Or when the things go badly, um, then it can, uh, uh, then the lawyer feels like they really didn't get anything and it creates all this tension with your client and you can be in a difficult position. And so, <clears throat> so either the client is going to feel that they substantially overpaid you. What happens is a lot of times lawyers agree, the client says, I'm starting a business, I don't have money to pay my lawyer, but I'll give you a 5% ownership share in my business. That's all. And you as the lawyer say, yeah, I'll take the risk except if the business explodes, like, I mean, it, it starts raining money, all of a sudden you're being paid ten, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars for doing a few hours of legal work. And in your mind, that might be fair, but from your client's standpoint, um, this is unjust enrichment. You did maybe $1,000, $2,000 worth of legal work, and now you're getting tens of millions of dollars or hundreds of millions of dollars in uh, um, corporate profits. And uh, that doesn't seem right, or your share of this hugely successful business. Um, or, or you as a lawyer agreed to do it, and then now you're kicking yourself because you realize that functionally you never got paid. <clears throat> now, how much ownership interest is too much? The malpractice insurers um, say that this, the, the more, more is worse. The, the more you have, the worse it is, and the, the less, the more in a malpractice action it's going to look like you weren't exercising independent legal um, judgment. And um, basically your ability to maintain an independent legal judgment is inversely correlated to the percentage of ownership that you have in your client's company. And so what they say is um, the rule of thumb for the malpractice insurers is 5%. Never, never, never take, they would say, take more than a 5% ownership share in your client's um, startup business. And otherwise the conflicts of interest will become too high and you're just inviting um, malpractice actions and so forth. In fact, keep in mind that <clears throat> a lot of um, malpractice policies will um, actually include an exclusion for covering you um, if you have either invest in the business or they have, they'll have the cutoff of 5%, that if you took more than a 5% ownership share, they don't have to cover you for malpractice liability. So watch out for that. Now, um, up till now, um, if you're going through <clears throat> these videos in order, we haven't had any type of attendance feature or quizzes um, uh, because I don't do, I didn't do them when we were first starting out. But we, as we go through the course, people, uh, pe students, uh, it's natural for people to kind of drop off or, or stop really watching things. So we're going to have a little question. And what you can do, and um, is, this is a quiz question, 
is if you want to document that you, for purposes of a law school course, that you watch this video, you can either email me the answer to the question for the video, or uh, it's not completely necessary. You can just keep it for your records in case there's ever a question that arises about your attendance and you need to document that you watch the video. So how many documents or writings does Rule 1.8a mention in its requirements? One, two, three, or four, and see if you can guess the answer. I'm also breaking this um, lecture up. I'm gonna do a, a second lecture about 1.A and the comments from uh, the ABA's model rules so that the, this doesn't get too long. 